Thank you, Trevor. Give Trevor a round of applause, please. You stole an awful lot of what I was going to say, so uh, thanks for that. Uh, guys, we'll all just go home now, shall we? <laughs> um, we're going to... Let me point this out. Our t today's message um, can seem a little bit um, frightening at the start, but if you're in Jesus, it is not frightening. And by the end of today, by the end of this service, I hope that your spirit is on fire, activated. My heart is that you will be stepping into your calling. We're not called to be pew sitters. No one is called to the church to take up a seat. That's not true. You're called to be activated and be part of the body of Christ, to be part of the army of Christ. And you're called into these times. And how amazing is it that when darkness encroaches upon the land the way it has, that God foreseen before time even existed, that you would be who he places in this time to be a light, to be a kingdom-minded believer who walks out the glory of God and shows his presence in these times. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of in awe of that. Um, we'll leave the announcements to the end, if that's okay, Chris, but if you remind me, because you know what I'm like. And let's pray. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for spirit activating motivation that you lift us up, that you enable us to walk out the walk that you've called us for. Lord, I say that right now as we listen, as we talk, as we, as we go through your word, that we are motivated, spiritually active, that you stoke our fire till it becomes a blazing inferno, that the world can see it. And Lord, they will hear the new song that you put in our heart and they will fear because we are walking out singing your praises in the midst of any circumstance. And Father, I just say you are on the throne. So we are not stressed, not worried, not anxious about anything because you are on the throne and you're directing your saints in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So, we are looking, and we're on this Generation Z. Oh, by the way, does everybody like my top? We make these, right? So if anybody wants to buy these and support the church, <laughs> that's just a wee shameless plug. Um, guys, we are going to look at this in the global sense, the Generation Z globalist movement, and Trevor touched on a few things there. The other week I threw, I should throw up a video about the UN and the WEF committing to a joint agreement which, by the way, in this press conference that they had, they only had two reporters. That's why you know they're trying to put things under the carpet. But they committed to this joint agreement to push in to accelerate the 2030 agenda. Now, when you see this, I told you last week to be aware of the, the spiritual aspect around the United Nations. The spiritual aspect of globalism that we're seeing in the world right now. The world is marching, like we said a few weeks ago, towards Shinar. They're marching towards Babylon. They're marching towards Babel. And as they're marching, the saints are to stand in opposition to that, speak truth at all times, exude love at all times, to emanate the gospel wherever they go. We're to go out with the Matthew 10, 8 commission to raise the dead, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. We're to go out with Matthew 28 in mind to make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to see this atmosphere change. It is the supernova moment before the church is raptured. Now, who wants to shine for Jesus? Just, just If you want to shine for Jesus, then this is what we need to listen to. We need to be motivated about where we're at because we are closer than ever to the, the emergence of, of a new world order. We're closer than ever. In fact, that key phrase is consistently being used. In fact, when, when we talked about the WHO there, one of the key phrases, if you read through the terminology, is they use this phrase, we're at an inflection point. And if you actually go on the same literature and you look at what major world leaders are saying, we're at this inflection point in history where things are going to change and we're going to step into this new world system. Now, if that is the case, and listen, people can call me a conspiracy theorist. You're wrong. I'm a biblical realist. When I see the Bible playing out in front of me, I can't keep quiet about it. Right. And the spirit of God is ignited within me. And the point of that is, is that we are to set the captives free. We're to speak freedom from bondage to everyone. You're, you're not saved just for you. You're saved and inducted into the army of God to go out and to make disciples, to save those around you. God provoked my heart years ago when he showed me, I was walking down the street, I had what I call a live vision, something that I seen as I walked. And as I walked, God showed me fire consuming people who were walking toward me. 
And I heard the Spirit of God speak to me. They will continue to burn if you don't speak up. Our job is to stand like gatekeepers, like guardians, and actually speak the truth. There's someone in your life right now that you haven't spoke truth out to because you go, well, I'm not that type of Christian. You know, I, I have that quiet faith. By the way, there is no such thing in Scripture as quiet faith. That's all. The example of the early church is boldness. Boldness that moved the, a, a small collection of people into the worldwide movement that became the church. A boldness that said that we would stand up against tyrannical rule that wanted to, to quash down on the truth and deny the truth. Guys, we, can't, we need to take the example of the early church. We need to have that boldness and not be quiet. Listen, we're living in days in which there's this, this different gospel. Galatians 1, 6, and 6 to 9, if you could open up there or you could throw it up for me, Chris. There's a different gospel being pushed out. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. Did I give you it? There we go. I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel. Hold on to that what word. Want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Hold on to that we phrase. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches to you another gospel to you than, than what you have received, let him be accursed. That's the point. No one can take away from this word. We are living in a time in which the world has been consumed and pre-programmed. We have been pre-programmed and we've walked sleepily into this. And I believe it's now time for the remnant church to rise. For the church that lives with the boldness of Christ. Lives with, are led by the spirit of God. Romans 8, 14. Are guided by the word. Because it's a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. And do not depart from either. That's the remnant. The remnant have to rise right now. I'm telling you because this perverted gospel isn't coming. It's been here a while. Listen, let me, let me explain this, right? The UN. We're talking about the UN. When we talk about the UN, look at what they're doing in regards to education. We know this because um, I looked into this simply because we homeschool. Now, there's homeschool bills coming out because the government have decided they don't like homeschool. Because when you homeschool, you're in charge of your kids' education. And when you homeschool, the indoctrination has stopped. When you homeschool and home educate your children, and you, you teach them the truth of the gospel, and you teach them, rather than indoctrinate them, then that's scurry to a world specifically how it's going right now. There's a thing called UNESCO, if you've heard of UNESCO, United Nations um, Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Let me explain something. Um, some years ago, he died in 2010, there was a guy called Robert Miller. Robert Miller worked for the United Nations and he developed something called the World Core Curriculum. Now, Robert Miller was a New Age spiritualist. He did not like Christianity. He stood against Christianity. He believed in the pantheistic idea that there's many ways to God, many ways to heaven, and we should all go that way. And the key word to there, we spoke about this the other week, is relativism or tolerance. It is a mask that says that, look, you know, for us to walk with God, you know, and go to God, we can't turn around and tell people there's only one way because that's judgment. And the idea that you take the judge out of the equation leaves everybody permissible to do what they want. So Robert Mueller wrote this doctrine. This doctrine was then established as an educational framework. So New Ageism is within the educational system. Within America, for instance, it was adopted by uh, Bill Clinton. It was, let me see, I'm sure, it was named the Golds 2000. Under George Bush, it was No Child Left Behind. And then it was readopted by and renamed under each successive administration from there. But it is the UN cultural core doctrine that is based on New Ageism that is infiltrated through the educational system. So when you hand your children over for an X portion of the, uh, a portion of the day and say, take care of my children. And this is not against teachers, by the way, at all. This is talking about what is coming underneath, what has been underneath. It is the idea that, you know, I remember, does anybody remember doing RE at school? 
Funny enough, I was really good at it. RE was my key subject. But whenever you see it nowadays, RE, you've got I done and I done A level RE and I went to, school, to a university and I remember the first year doing history and theology and then dropping theology. Guess this because my theology teacher was an atheist. <laughs> this is the educational system. I'm not having to go at teachers at all and talking about the, what's being brought in. The idea now is completely different. You can't focus on Christianity despite us being a Christian nation. You can't focus on, 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 on Jesus being the only way because you have to open their eyes up to everything. New Ageism, I told you before, starts with the, 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 at the root of New Ageism is the gospel of the serpent. That isn't a made up colloquialism, that's the gospel of the serpent. That's what, they, what comes to the core of New Ageism. And they believe that we're in this. And I'm telling you that we're moving to it because the one world hearted system is being built. And it's time for the church to stand in opposition. We know that, like, like Trevor pointed out, in two weeks time, the WHO is effectively going to be handed on this. Everybody petitions their, their MLA and their, their MPs. They're going to be handed unprecedented power. Right? It is going to global governance. Chris, I give you a wee video, it's 30 seconds long. Can you show it for me? In a week's time, a vote will take place in Geneva, Switzerland at the World Health Assembly. They're important because they're the governing body of the World Health Organization, WHO. This authority that they would be given would impact 99.4% of all the people in the world. There are 193 nations belonging to the UN. The Biden administration is bringing amendments that were proposed that all the nations of the earth cede their sovereignty over national health care decisions to the WHO. The world no. I cut that down. The actual full video is up on our Facebook page. Have a look at it if you haven't already had a look at it. It's extremely important. What is happening, and if you look at things that are happening around the world right now, look at Shanghai. Look at the lockdown that is happening in Shanghai, and it's scary, right? There are tales of people jumping off buildings because they would rather commit suicide than starve to death. The goal is the sanctity of life. Well, already the doctrine of demons is infiltrated to the church and it is infiltrated in massive ways. I'm going to show you how. There was a guy, and you can show his picture for me if you can there, Chris. Um, and his name was um, Joseph Fletcher. And Joseph Fletcher was this, uh, he was the head of the Episcopal Theological College at Harvard. He was probably one of the most prominent theologians of the last century. And it is important that you realize that a lot of his teachings infiltrated the church, infiltrated the Protestant church, infiltrated our theology and our ideology. But if that's the case, you need to know who he is and what he was about. So to give you an idea, this is Joseph Fletcher. Is the picture up? He looks like a sweet old man. Yeah? Joseph Fletcher was an activist and a theological teacher, but seen as one of the most prominent of the last century, he helped set up and establish Planned Parenthood. Now that should already be alarm bells. The church is establishing the abortion mill that is very regularly supplying all abortion mills around the world. He not only did that, he set up the Right to Die Society, believed in euthanasia. His wife worked, worked closely with Margaret Sanger, the, the, the founder of Planned Parenthood. In 1966, he wrote a book called Situation Ethics. Now this is key, because this is the idea that morality is flexible. And what the church did, they adopted this, this idea, this new ideology. Morality is flexible, based on your situation. So what did that allow them to do? Let's throw out the Old Testament. Let's throw out all of that. And listen, we get this and it's preached very much nowadays, specifically on TV. We're not subject to the law. We're not subject to the commandments. And that is absolute nonsense. Our Lord didn't come and say you're not subject to the commandments. He turned around and he said the commandments hang on two commandments. He fulfilled the law. It is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind. And love your brother as yourself. In other words, it is all depicted around love. love. The commandments can't get thrown out. But under this situational 
ethics book, the church decided we don't need the law or the commandments. That got thrown out. I've been in churches that believe this. And it's crazy, but this is what's happening. And listen, he goes further, right? So he throws out this situational ethics. And you think, well, you know what? That's just one strand of Protestantism. No, it infiltrated so many. And then in his later years, he became a bioethics leader, right? In other words, he supplied the moral arguments around abortion. He supplied the moral arguments around euthanasia. Then he openly came out, I'm an atheist. Now, the biggest theological leader that we see turns around in his later life, says that he's an atheist, and the church goes, well, we're just going to hang on to what he's taught, because what he's taught, you know, it fits what we want. It means that you come as you are, you stay as you are, you never change. You can stay in your old worldly system. You can think like the world, act like the world, be like the world, and still be considered a Christian. Yet the Bible teaches something extremely different. <laughs> It says that the product of grace is seen in Titus 2, where it says that it is in the act of holiness. When you have grace, that undeserved, unmerited favor of his gift of salvation upon your life, it is seen and worked out through your holy living. In fact, in Philippians, we're told to work out our salvation through fear and trembling, not to go, well, you know what? This situation doesn't call for me to do anything. Situational ethics applied in the parable. Jesus dealt with it when the parable of the Good Samaritan. Oh, well, you know, I'm on my way to the temple, so I'm not going to stop and help you. That situational ethics has infiltrated the church and caused the church to do what the devil wanted them to do. To not stand and be active, but to sit and be silent. That's not what we're called to. We're called to motivation. We're called to be on fire. It says that don't hide your light under a bushel. And what has happened is the church has not only hit their, lid on, hit, hit their fire under a bushel, they've thrown water on it, they've hit it around, they've made sure that they're all coming up as the occasional smoke signal that says on Facebook, I'm a Christian, but out in society, don't look like it. <laughs> this is what we've got to get on. There's another woman, right? I'm going to go to her. In fact, let me tell you, sorry, Joseph Fletcher not only became an atheist in the end of his life, he advocated, just based on what Trevor said, for euthanasia for children up to the age of 10. Selective euthanasia. Now, no matter how many times your kid does your head in, and I got five kids. <sighs> But no matter how many times they do your head in, euthanasia is not an option. That's, that's back to the Old Testament. That's Leviticus 18. That's Moloch worship. There's another woman, Bella Todd. Bella Todd later in life confirmed that she encouraged young communists to join the Roman Catholic Church. Why? Because communism teaches that state is God. And if you can infiltrate the church and corrupt it from the inside, then you can. They're no longer God's no longer the focal point for society. God's removed and states in place. She confirmed that she had actively put eleven hundred young communists into the ministry, who a lot are now bishops and cardinals. So they're not only setting the way and leading the way. It's, 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 this is just, I just want to point this out to you. This is why the church is in the state it's in. The Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, or Sciences, uh, their CCP division, um, and one of the atheist professors who was involved in a 20 year study said this about the West. We studied everything we could from historical, political, economical, and cultural perspective. And at the first, at first, we thought it was because you had more powerful guns than we had. Talking about the success of the West. Then we thought it was because you had the best political system. Next, we thought on your economic system. But in the past 20 years, we realized that the heart of your culture is your religion. That is why the West is so powerful. Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life was what made possible the emergence of capitalism and then the successful transition to democratic politics. We do not have any doubt about this. Do you understand? Look, we talked about this before. In 1917, there was the development of political correctness. under, And it was an ideology, it was a, it was a theory based on a social ideology of communism. How do we keep people doing what they're supposed to do? Well, we give them a new moral guideline. 
a moral guideline not set by God, but set by the state that says, do you know what? We believe that now is the time for murdering babies. Or we believe that now you can marry a horse because it's all about you. It's relative. Truth is relative. Now this is being pushed and this infiltrated the UN. This infiltrated the top government systems and it's been used around the world. And this is, you can go and everything that I say, go and look up. Everything. This has infiltrated us. This has infiltrated the world. This has infiltrated the church. And it's, it's scary in the sense because the idea that, that you look at this and you think, well, look, you know, I'm okay, me, myself, and I, I'm fine. I want, you, I want you to get hold of some stats here. In Britain, a recent poll showed that 55% of adults in Britain believe in ghosts. 51% believe in aliens. And 25% believe in God. You don't think we, the, the system's been infiltrated? You don't think we've been put in the back of it? 25% of adults in Britain believe in God. But they believe in E.T. quicker. They believe in Patrick Swayze quicker. But they're not believing in God. This is the system that we're living in. And I believe there's a scripture in Isaiah 58 that tells us now is the time to repair the breach. I believe that our commission right now is to stand for the generation and for us. We're not, we're not exempt from this because we walk in this blindly. Half of us go along with what the world says rather than what the gospel says. I want to be a down-to-earth Christian. Here's a, 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 a very big awakener for you. There's no such thing. I get told off that I'm too heavenly minded. And to be heavenly minded is apparently no worldly good. Well, here's the thing. I am heavenly minded. And when I'm heavenly minded, my father steps in. And I know that I am a citizen of heaven. Colossians 3 tells me such. I'm not a citizen of this earth. So when I come in, my job is to be an ambassador. Like Paul, if I'm an ambassador in chains, I'm still an ambassador. I walk knowing that he has me. Knowing that he has me protected. Why? Because I walk with political immunity. I walk knowing that he is my cover. I'm telling you right now, we are living in a time in which the world has to wake up, the church, sorry, has to wake up to the structure that has now infiltrated the church and leading from the pulpit. Yeah. I, 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 I get frustrated, you might say. I get worked up about this, but I think it's time for us to pull out of the world. In Genesis 12, when Abraham, where Abraham at this stage, he left the Ur of Chaldeans. I showed on Wednesday, Terah, his father, was um, a Id wicked, idolatrous priest. He used to, he, had a, he owned his own idol shop. He had idol, idolatry worship continuously. He was the priest that was under Nimrod. He was second command off Babel. And he was, he was this wicked priest. And when Nimrod found out that he was going to have Abraham and he looked up and he saw what we saw last year, which was a conjunction in the heaven because God gives us signs in the heavens, not as astrology, but Genesis 1.14 says that they are there. Sun, moon and stars are there for signs, seasons and times. And we can discern, that's what the sons of Issachar did. I'm talking fast, but I've got a lot to get through. So when we look at this, we saw that Nimrod had seen that this sign was in the heavens, that this guy would be born who would bring victory and conquest. He said to Terah, Go and kill your son. Sacrifice your son to me. Now Terah, being an idolatrous, wicked priest, loved his son, but had no value for life. So what he did was he got a, another child, and he smashed the child's brains in in front of Nimrod. And that appeased Nimrod. Then years later, he had hidden Abraham away. Now this is all historical. This is in the book of Jasher, and it's, um, it, it's in a couple of other historical books referenced within the Bible. Years later, when Abraham had grown up, Abraham, who had a, a connection with God, who was considered a friend of God, he walked into his father's idol shop where he made the money and he smashed up all the idols. Right? He went to town. Then his dad comes back and he says, you did this, Abraham. And he says, no, uh, your one idol picked on the other idol and decided to start a fight and they all knocked each other out. I'm paraphrasing. And his dad says, that's impossible. And he goes, ah. But <laughs> his dad then takes him to Nimrod and says, look, you know, we're going to kill him. And what, what is the instruction that we see in Genesis 12? This has always sort of boggled my mind until I read the history of this. In Genesis 12, now the Lord has said to Abraham, get out of your country 
and from your family. Because part of me would always go, well, why is he leaving his family? Now, he didn't. He took his family with him. But why would you, God instruct him to get away from his family? Because his family were trapped in idolatrous worship. Now, we know through historical sources that Terah eventually believes in Yahweh, comes to Yahweh, and renounces his idolatrous pantheism. But at this stage, Abraham is instructed, get out of your country and from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There is a call right now that you are around people. You're surrounded by people who are trying to infiltrate you and set the culture upon you saying, yeah, you know, see when you're around me, please don't talk about Jesus. Just make me feel a bit uncomfortable. Or when you're around me, let's talk about this. And they try and bring in the culture, which is based in wickedness. They try and bring in the new ageism of the day. Oh, here, sit here. It's only a bit of harmless fun. Let's read our astrology stars. Right? It's not. It's not fun. That's not right. We need to do what Abraham was told to do and to get out. Now, I'm not talking about get out and stop witnessing. We're called to be separate from the world. Sanctified and holy. A different look upon you than whenever circumstance comes at you. Whenever the rain falls on the wicked and the just the same. Whenever it falls on you, you don't react like the world reacts. You react how God tells you to react. Because you know who your father is. You know you're not a citizen of this world. Whenever globalism is marching to this conclusion, this cacophony of sound where you think, oh my goodness, what is going to happen here? Oh, look at how darkness, what is it? Because the WHO will have the whole power to shut down an area based on whatever perceivable threat they have. They will have a power to enforce certain medical procedures based on whatever procedure or whatever effect they perceive. And you could fear it. Are you going, now? Nah, I'm not a citizen of this world. I'm a citizen of heaven. And as such, I'm going to shine. I'm going to shine. Where Colossians 2 tells you, don't let anyone cheat you through empty deceit and philosophy. That's what New Ageism is. That is what has infiltrated the world. And I'm saying, don't let anybody cheat you. If it doesn't line up with gospel, it has no room in your life. Amen? Ephesians 4, 14 says, do not be moved. By every wind of doctrine. See, in end times, there's all these different winds. When there is spurt, the word ruach, right? It's where we get holy, the Holy Spirit. Ruach HaKadish, right? The Spirit of the Holy God. That's where we get that word. Ruach, when the ruach blows, we're only to be moved by the Spirit of God. Not by every spirit that tries to deceive mankind. Seriously. Oh, well, you know, we should just all sign up for this. Or we should just do this. Or we should just do that. You know what? It is not my place to get involved because I'm just, I go to church. I pay my tithe. I, I, I pray. And rubbish. Imagine the early church had that ideology. We're not to affect the culture. We're not to come against the wickedness of the day. In fact, we're just to sit in our wee house, our wee home, and just, just preach the word of God and that's it. No. They knew their commission. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask you right now, who was the, or when was the last time you witnessed to someone about Jesus? If it wasn't this week, it's too long. Honestly. And I'm not talking about sharing, you know, conspiracy theories of today. I'm talking about bringing Jesus to them. I said to you at the start, who wants to shine? And I, I covered this earlier in the week. I want to get through it. But Isaiah 58, I can't get away from it right now. It has sat with me all week. It is one of those scriptures that I have just, I started, I underlined. And I know some people don't like writing in their Bibles, but um, this is my new Bible. Because uh, the other one was written in far too much. That I stopped being able to read what was in front of me. I, I in this chapter, I look at it right now. I've underlined every word, which is uh, not very helpful, really. But if you start at verse six, actually, I'm going to read verse eight first. Based on what's verse six and verse seven of Isaiah 50, it says, "You get verse eight. Verse eight says, "Then your light shall break forth like the morning." 
In fact, Isaiah 60 says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness of people, but let the Lord will arise over you. So I want you to ask yourself the question, is Jesus seen through me? Is the light of God seen in every step that I go? Every step that I, I usher forward with? Every step that he's established? Do people see Jesus? It's, 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 it's an honest question. It's not a question that a lot of people will like. But I'm telling you, you need to, to examine yourself. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one. Judge yourself lest you be judged. Am I walking out the walk? <laughs> Oh, well, I believe in Jesus. Do you know how many people I meet on an outreach who say they, be, they believe in Jesus? They're not Christian. They're not saved. People have taken the, the scripture in Romans 10 where it says, believe in, your mouth and confess, or believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and you will be saved. And they said, that's all I need to do. Now I go back to my ways. But listen, how different is that from the demons? If James 2.19 says that even the demons believe and they tremble, how different is that? The, the point of being a Christian is not simply saying a prayer. Do you realize that there's no, there's no scripture to support that? I said a prayer, now I'm saved. There's no scripture to support that. It's about picking up your cross and following him. Isaiah 58 verse 6. Is this not the fast that I have chosen for you? To loose the binds or the bounds of wickedness. So take that one there. To loose the bounds of wickedness. Do you see wickedness today? Anybody see wickedness when they go out and about? Anybody see? I got an echo on this. Does anybody see wickedness in their job? Does anybody see wickedness on the TV? I don't see any hands because I'm the only one. <laughs> Put your Bible up. <laughs> We're to loose those binds. In other words, we're not to be silent in these times. We're to speak our truth. Ephesians 4, 15 says, speak truth in love, always. We're to speak truth, not that we're lecturing people, but we're to go on and say, look, why are you suffering from anxiety, fear, and stress? Why are you walking with the world? Why are you consumed by this? Let me tell you about the hope of Jesus. Before my dad passed, for about two years, he sat, because it was during the pandemic, and he sat and he would watch 24-hour news. And he was consumed with fear. And it broke my heart, because my dad was like, he's a man's man. I, I, I remember coming to him not long before he passed last year and saying to him, Dad, have you made the decision? Have you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior? And I'll not give you the, I'll give you the edited version. <laughs> and his words were, yes, I have. This is the edited version. Now go. <laughs> yeah, there was a bit of a beeps, yeah. <laughs> but he did. And the thing is, is that, look, fear can consume you, but it's our job to go out there and bring hope to those in fear. It's our job. Listen. Have you witnessed to everybody you know? Have you? Everybody that you know that's in your circle, that's in your, your environment, have you witnessed to them? Have you told them about Jesus? Because if you haven't, then there's something wrong there. You need to convict yourself to the point that you go, hold on a minute, I'm not going to be silent anymore. Because the reason you're silent is because of its, its pride. It's the idea that you don't want them to see you in a certain fashion and you don't want them to walk away from you. The minute I confessed to my friends that Jesus was my Lord and Savior. These were friends I had for like, since school, right up, you know. I stopped seeing them. Not by my choice. But sometimes that happens. Whenever you step out for Jesus, sometimes the world will reject you. But here's the thing. Be of good cheer for he overcame the world. I would rather fear God than fear man. I would rather serve God than serve man's interest. Because man wants to put you in a box and God wants to set you free. And that goes to the next bit. It says to undo the heavy burdens. The burdens that are weighing you down. How do we undo the heavy burdens? Matthew 11 says that you bring 
You sell all your burdens to Jesus. Come to me all who labor and are heavy burdened and I will give you rest. Your job right now to be able to see your light and to shine is to make sure that you're walking bringing down wickedness, wickedness, casting out wickedness, coming in and bringing the love of God where wickedness has been, and then to bring as many as you can to the, the burden lifter, to the yoke breaker. To let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. To let the oppressed go free. Okay. What sets someone free? Starts with a T. Ends with a girl's name. Truth. There we go. Truth sets you free, and free indeed. No, Trudy isn't there, I don't say nothing. Um, <laughs> truth sets you free. And then it goes, is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and to bring to your house the poor who are cast out? That's talking as well, not just a practical form of feeding people, but Matthew 4 says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God, to bring in the word of God into all situations. When you see the naked, that you cover him. Your job is not to expose the shame of others, but to cover it. To bring the love of God in and cover it. Your job is not to go out and expose their, their wickedness and their shame. Your job is to come in and say, look, you can be clothed in the righteousness of God by following him. Not just by believing in him, but by following in him. And not hide yourself from your own flesh. I don't know about you, but I want to shine like Isaiah 58. Verse 8 says, I want my, my, my light to break forth like morning dawn. I want it to shine. And one of the things that you've got to do is to continually examine your walk. When have you been talking about someone behind their back? When was the last time? If your face goes down right now, I know you've been talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> Gossip, according to Proverbs 6, is an abomination. Why? Because it sows discord. When, when have you went out and, like, when have you went out and you just acted like the world, reacted like the world, lived like the world, and forgot about God, and then you came back and you thought, well, you know what, nobody needs to know about it, I'll do that, I'll become a habitual sinner, I'll just be regular. And we're not saying that you don't drop the ball sometimes. But you don't have habitual sin. A believer shouldn't have the habit of habitual sin. It shouldn't have that. It shouldn't be the case. That every time you get around the same group of people, you go, did you see? That pastor was wearing today. He wore a hoodie. And he tried to sell us them. <laughs> well, in my defense, I was going to give you a discount. <laughs> One for 30 or two for 70. <laughs> um, oh, I'm throwing that. Um, <laughs> your light shall break forth. Listen, guys. One of the things that we're going to do today is I'm going to show you um, a couple of people to see in here. A couple of people to go to and talk to if you want to get involved. Because, listen, you're not called. Like, serving in a church doesn't mean that... I don't know, you stand at the door and greet people. We personally don't have a greeter. Right? No, not yet, not yet. We personally don't have a greeter. We don't we do not do it. Why? Because I think everybody should be doing that job. Everybody should be saying hi to someone. Everybody should be hugging someone. Everybody should be high-fiving someone if you're like me. Because I don't do the hug thing as well. But whenever you're doing this, it should be a continual part of your walk. That's not serving the, the kingdom. I'm sorry. Serving the kingdom is actually doing what the Great Commission says. Well, I don't know if I'm called to full-time ministry like you, but here's the thing. Every single person is called to full-time ministry. Every That's single right. believer. I purposely have a job. I have, my, I have another job that I, I live off that wage. I live off that. That's mine. But I spend the majority of my time running the church, serving the church, on outreaches, serving the people in the church. That's my job. That's my commission, sorry. That's my, that's my mandate. 
You've got five priorities in life. I remember my old pastor teaching me this. Five priorities in life. First one is God. Second one is your relationship with God. In other words, you need to devote specific time. We talked about this last week. Make a date with God. I have dates with Jesus all the time. Right? God and in your relationship with God. Your third one is your family and friends. Because that, listen, guys, that's your first ministry. If you're specifically, if you're a bloke, if you're a husband right now, your first ministry is to your family and friends. You're a high priest in that arena. Okay? Your fourth one is your ministry. Your, your, your ability to go out and make disciples of all nations. And in your fifth one is your work. But what happens within 99% of Christians is that. I'll go to work first. Work's the number one. It's all about work. And then when I get a bit of time, I'll maybe go on an outreach. And when I get a bit of time, I'll maybe go and serve in a part of the, the ministry. When I get a bit of time. God does not want your leftovers. There's a reason he demands your first fruits. He doesn't want your leftovers. I'm not talking about money here. He demands your first fruits. He demands the first fruits of you. Right? Him first. Then when, when you get that, then they come to their family and friends and they try and squeeze them in because, you know, we're so consumed with work and we're so consumed with what has to be done. Then we, the family and friends, they get pushed to the side. We're not ministering them. We're just thinking that we're socialized with them. Oh, and then it's about me and my relationship with God. And what that is now reduced down is, God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Please, 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 please. That's not a relationship. Anybody ever had like a girlfriend or a boyfriend that was like that? That wasn't talking about my wife, by the way. Just, you know. <laughs> and then your last one, when you've done it like that, ends up being God. And God gets a, what I call a God nod. I went to church on Sunday. Go me. That's not it. I want, we're called to be repairs of the breach. That's verse, tw verse 12, the last part of verse 12. Repair of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. We're called to repair the breach for the generation that's coming. And how that starts is us going out and ministering to absolutely everybody we can. You can't shut up about Jesus. If they tell you to shut up and work about Jesus, don't. If they then say you're going to lose your job, praise God, God will give me another job. If they turn around and they say you can't speak about Jesus in Tesco's, you can't witness about Jesus in Tesco's or Sainsbury's or any other shop. But when if they say that, you know, that doesn't stop you. There will come a time in which we are so clamped down upon that the voice of a, 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 a believer who is bold in Christ will be shut down by imprisonment. But until that time, speak up. And even at that time, that's the time your prison ministry starts. <laughs> we need to be so God, so kingdom minded, so focused on his kingdom. Listen, this is what Jesus did. He didn't come and say, I'm going to just preach the gospel of prosperity. I'm going to preach the gospel of healing. I'm going to preach the gospel. That's absolute idolatrous rubbish. He came and says, I'm preaching the kingdom. And the kingdom of heaven brings healing. The kingdom of heaven is healing. The kingdom of heaven is provision. My God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19. He supplies. My God is my healer. In fact, he heals all of my infirmities. Psalm 103 verse 3. We need to walk in that. These are just assets or parts, aspects of the kingdom. But if you want to shine... You need to realize that your daily walk, your daily walk, not out of self-effort, but out of the Holy Spirit that leads you, is one of this daily fast. Everywhere you go, oh God, I woke up this morning. Wickedness, you better watch out. I'm going to come into a place wherever I can, and I'm going to bring love where there's wickedness. When I walk up to that group of people who are talking about someone in a derogatory way, I'm going to go up and I'm going to purposely change the subject, and they're not going to like me. I'm going to talk about Jesus. Seriously. The church has to be the church because here's the thing. Jesus is coming back extremely soon. I heard a, a, a preacher called Pete Garcia say this. He was given, a, he actually done an article on this. When can Jesus not come back? And he based it upon technology. Because of all the world over one court, he started to list different types of technology that surpass the time frame that will allow for the second coming or even the rapture of Jesus Christ. Because we're talking in 2029, Elon Musk is talking that there will be a station on Mars that will be inhabited, full-time inhabitation, right? Now, whether that happens or not, but listen, that would surpass the time frame. 
because there's no there's no uh, set and coming that Jesus just stops off at Mars, you know, and then pops across to see who's sitting on the moon and then comes down to us. It doesn't work like that. That surpasses the time frame. I'm telling you, with the UN and the WEF and the WHO all in cahoots to turn around and to bring in, they're taking away and they're stripping liberty, they're stripping freedom, and they think that affects the Christian? No chance. Paul was an ambassador in chains. Whenever Paul was, was held down to the point that he was chained to one side, chained to the other side, and his feet would have been chained too, they didn't chain his mouth. They didn't gag him. So what tended to happen, this is according to church history, is that the guards that were guarding him, he would witness to the guards, the guards would get saved. So then what they did is they, they reduced the time in which the guards spent with him. So they would take those guards away, saying, no, you spent time with that Christian, and now you're saved, come away. And then they would start to put them on shifts. They'll go on eight-hour shifts. The problem was, is he got his patter down, he started to witness quicker, he started to share his testimonies, talk about Jesus, and they started to get saved even quicker. To the point that this racked the brains of the officials, that every, every prison guard that came in was getting the gospel and getting saved. It is not about the restrictions they put on you unless you are physically unable to witness through speech or through word or through typing or whatever. You should be sharing everywhere. Everywhere. I, look, I know I'm over time. Stuff it. I don't care. If you care, you can go. I'm going to preach to myself. Because I'm telling you, this is the time to restore the streets. We are to restore the streets. That's what it's called. To the restorer of streets to dwell in. We're to go out there and take over the atmosphere. We're to repair the breach. That false teaching infiltration of doctrine of demons has broken down the church, has broken down the body to the body being ineffectual and unable to follow Jesus. I say no more. I say we get up and we do more, right? We do more. If it's a case of going out and witnessing with me, uh, who wants to go out with me tonight? I'm going to, I'm going to go out in the town tonight and witness anybody. There we go. We've got a cook team already. So we're going out tonight and we're witnessing. Wherever you go, you get a chance to share the gospel. You get a chance to serve. I mean, family and friends, listen, they're going to burn if you don't speak up. I wish he would teach something about how I get rich quick. I don't do that stuff. I'm preaching the kingdom. And we're to bring the kingdom. I want you to look at, if you put up the, the pictures there for me. So these are people that you need to see. So if you're talking about homeless outreach or street church, Dre, I just stole your photo. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> uh, and then if you're talking about community and welfare reach, that's starting in different community sections, including our prison ministry. Then we see William. Can you go to the next one? Okay, for Sunday school youth ministry and doorstep church, see Kelly. Let me just say this quickly about the Sunday school. The Sunday school is not a sideline to the church. They are the church. Took me ages to get this. Really did. I was on Sunday school once. <laughs> I realized it's not my gifting. I ended up giving up after five minutes and I, had, I brought these bow and arrows as a prop and I just said, shoot yourself. And I sat down. And it's why I don't run it. But if you see what that Sunday school is doing, those kids are the quickest kids to go and pray over anyone. Anyone. In fact, when my wife lost her eyesight, and some of you remember that. She was, she was classed as legally blind. She, her eyes went gray. And it was, ugh, it was It wasn't quite nice to look at. Feel for me. I had to drive everywhere for months. <laughs> but anyway, all of this happened. And we had a prayer meeting. And we thought, you know what? You know, we're all walking in the Holy Spirit. Watch this. Boom. And nothing happened. Nothing happened. And then one of the kids... <clears throat> Little Tiernan came up and says, what's wrong with your eye? And he probably done the face that I was doing. <laughs> and she says, she just told him, hands on, prayed, in Jesus' name, it was something really simple. In Jesus' name, see. Something really, really simple. And I think it was uh, like about 30 minutes later, she just started to see, started to see me and started to see shapes and started to see people walking around. And it was... Back. Our eyesight's back. 
This is what I'm saying is, is that Sunday school is not a sideline. If anybody wants to volunteer in a Sunday school, what I'm saying is you're, you're ministering to saints and to generals. Some of those kids are like, they're proper warriors. They are, they're going to shake hell. And I'm not talking in 10 years time. I'm talking now. So if you want to get involved with that, see Kelly. If you want to get involved with Doorstep Church, see Kelly. Doorstep Church is what, something that we came up through, with through the pandemic. It was an idea that where they told us we couldn't have church and we says, yeah, we can't. So we're going to go and do it at people's doorsteps. And we go and knock the door. We tell them about Jesus. Sometimes you sing a song. Sometimes you pray. Sometimes you just go and get them shopping. Whatever it is. But it's bringing the church to the people. If you want to get involved with Connect, Connect runs every Monday. Um, you see Alyssa. And the Connect ministry is all about serve in the community it's all about going out we make teas coffees and give them refreshments on the street as they walk past and then we get an opportunity to pray with them we've seen healings we've seen salvations through connect ministry it's brilliant and what was the other one there food bank the same again uh see Alyssa if you want to volunteer in the food bank because listen as the food crisis increases anybody notice your shopping prices your shopping costs has increased yeah. anyone yeah, I notice, I don't shop, but it's, it's, it's through the roof and there are people who are struggling to put anything on the table. So the food bank is not a, a sideline, it's a necessity. And the way our food bank works was we only now do non-perishables and we think that that's the best way because we don't know what next week's going to happen. We don't want people throwing out food. So we do non-perishables. If you want to get involved with food bank, see Alyssa, she'll get you plugged in. And listen, we're getting, we're getting hit with needs with this. And a church needs to serve. Is that, is that it? Oh yeah, and there's a ladies group as well on a Wednesday morning that's starting with Alyssa um, at 11 a.m. And that's teaching and so on because uh, uh, she'll get annoyed that I say this, but Alyssa's doing her uh, divinity degree. So that's a, a degree in theology. So yeah, she is annoyed. <laughs> Love it. So... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's just a bonus. Guys, get involved. If there's not something there for you, <coughs> create something. Don't wait for me. Right? Louise is starting a prayer meeting, aren't you, Louise? Yep, there you go. Louise is now starting a prayer meeting. See how this works? Just get involved. Get involved and get out there because, listen, you're the saints. You want to get to heaven, sit around the table with David, Abraham, and Moses, and Jacob, and all of those people. And they'll go, oh, do you know, what was it like to live in these days? In the days in which globalism consumed the world? In the days in which good was seen as evil and evil was seen as good? In the days in which wickedness ruled? What did you do? Uh, what, the church? Yeah, but what did you do? I, I want to be a doer of the word, not a hero only. Amen? Guys, stand for me. I'm going to pray. We're going to take up an offering. I'm going to invite the worship team up now. <laughs> no hugs, please. No hugs. <laughs> Guys, let's pray. Father God, I just thank you that you are establishing your army right now. And Lord, it says... And we're taught that about 20% of the church are those who serve, those who give, those who are involved. And I say, no, not for this church. We're going to reverse that. We're going to say that at least 80% are actively walking the walk and talking the talk. They are burning bright. They are fires lit. They are not embers. They are not throwing up smoke signals, Lord. Let their fire blaze. Lord, I want to be set on fire for your return. Oh, we want this church seen from heaven. We want the church to be noticed to the point that we see and we walk out the love that we have for you because Lord you love us so much how can we not walk it out and Father as we walk out this love as we walk as you establish each one of our steps Lord you put a new song in our heart that says that we will not fear the day in which we live we will not fear the atmosphere or the society culture that we're set upon but rather we will instill fear through the praising of you through the praising of you we will establish a fear of the Lord in the culture that we know that you are the one true God 
that you are Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, the Aleph and the Tav. You are above and not beneath, and you are head of everything. Lord, I thank you for sitting on the throne. I thank you for calling each and every one of us into your kingdom. And Lord, let us go out and be a vessel to help bring others into the kingdom. Lord, no man left behind. Let us take on that theology, that ideology, that no person shall ever be left behind. We will grab everybody in the kitchen sink to bring them into your kingdom, Lord. Let us go out with a fire in our bellies. And I speak fire right now. Fire, fire, fire into the bellies of everyone here, into their spurts, that they are lit ablaze, knowing that they are here not just to serve, but here to be lit ablaze, to be a fire, consuming fire, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Guys, I'm serious. See, when we worship here, I want to hear you singing like Pavarotti. Lift up your voices. Lift up your voices unto the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Oh, sorry.